Well, welcome to Voices of Experience. Um, my name is Scott McClagan, and I'm responsible for executive education here at the Daniels College of Business. I'm really, really excited about this program tonight. You know, healthcare is an amazingly volatile issue at the moment, as, as most of you know. We've been doing some executive leadership programs for, in the healthcare industry over the last few years. And it's amazing to me the amount of dynamicism, if that's a word, and the tremendous amount of change going on in that industry. And I would argue that there's probably no industry out there today that is going under more change than the healthcare industry. And fortunately, we have two great experts here tonight to talk with us about that. Before I get going, I'd like to, to make just a couple of announcements before we get going. First of all, I'd like to acknowledge our partners, our VOE partners, who their donations, their financial and in-kind donations make this, this whole series uh, possible. So from a financial perspective, we'd like to thank Grant Thornton, First Bank, CoBank, and the Rocky Mountain Human Resources People and Strategy Group. From an in-kind perspective, I'd like to thank Chase, the Denver Metro Chamber, Ethosphere Magazine, Net Impact, the Daniels Marketing Roundtable, and the Sturm College of Business. So thanks to all those folks for, for their help in VOE. Also, just as a, as a housekeeping, as you may or may not know, this, these sessions are eligible for CLEs, CPEs, CEUs, and all those other C things. Um, but you can sign up for those at the back table back here uh, after the session. Um, a couple other housekeeping things. We will be uh, having probably some time for some questions at the end, probably not a lot. And we've left you some note cards uh, on some of the chairs. If you have a burning question that you'd like to, to bring up, please write it on the card, pass it to the aisle. We'll collect those, all of those by the end of the fourth question, and then we will, we will do our best to answer those. We have a very scientific method for screening questions. Like, what are we going to do with all these? So anyway, um, that's, uh, and then the formal program will end around 7.15. We will have a reception with food in the back, and we'd like to, to welcome all of you to stay. So that's the, the logistics of this. And before I, I fully introduce uh, Dr. Gabo and Dr. Lin, I'd like to just throw out a few fast facts to set some context for the things that we're going to talk about tonight and give you an idea of the magnitude of the issues that we're facing in the healthcare industry. So let's start just thinking about the overall spending in this industry. In 2009, the US spending on healthcare was 2.5 trillion, with a T. Uh, that's $8,200 for every man, woman, and child in this country. Uh, that's 17.6% of our GDP. Very, very big number. To put this in perspective, in 1970, it was about 75 billion with a B, or about 356 uh, dollars per person. So for those of you who are thinking about math and the magic of compound interest, for the last 40 years, we have, our healthcare expenditures have grown at 2.4% above GDP growth for 40 years. Think about that for a minute. Now, the projections are by 2018, we will spend $4.3 trillion on health care, almost double, which will be $13,100 per man, woman, and child in this country. Again, think about the magnitude of that. that this has obviously hit our businesses. It has hit individuals. In the last 10 years alone, uh, health care insurance has gone up 138%, or two and a half times, essentially whereas real wages have gone up about 42%. <coughs> so think about the relative cost of health care insurance as opposed to how fast wages are rising. Very, very big gap going there. Now, obviously, businesses have found it difficult to continue to, to have health care for their, their employees, and individuals are having a hard time affording it. At this point, 16.7% of Americans don't have health insurance. That's almost 50 million people without health insurance. Now, believe it or not, there are black clouds on the horizon, uh, even given all of those. Um, January 1st of this year, the leading edge of the baby boomer generation 
the first ones turned 65 years old and made them eligible for Medicare. Uh, over the next 16 years, about 80 million people will be added to those roles, if you think about that. Just kind of a fun fact, somebody will be turning 65 every eight seconds for the next 16 years. It's kind of a good cocktail party uh, fact to know. Um, and as you may or may not know, about 50% of our health care uh, expenditures occur after we're 65. So if you take your entire integrated health spending you will over your life, about half of it occurs after you've turned 65 years old. So the projections are that the Medicare program will almost double from 47 million people enrolled today to almost 80 million by 2030. Medicare is expected to cost $929 billion by 2020, an 80% increase over the next 10 years. The prospect of the growing senior population that's living longer and costing more is considered the single biggest fiscal issue in the United States over the next 20 years. Staggering, staggering. So obviously what drove much of the discussion around health care reform over the last few years have been some of these big numbers that we're throwing around. So we're very lucky to have two true experts uh, here in the room that can, that can talk with us about this tonight. Uh, I have had a chance to work with both of these, these women and have a tremendous respect for them. And if I read all of their accomplishments, we'd be here the rest of the night. So I'm going to give you the, the Reader's Digest version of these. First of all, we have Dr. Patty Gabot. She is the CEO of Denver Health, which is considered one of the nation's most uh, efficient and highly regarded integrated healthcare system. Dr. Gabot, who is also a physician, led Denver Health from being part of the Denver City government to being an independent authority and is now able to serve both the most vulnerable people in Colorado as well as stay fiscally viable, which is, which is not an easy task. She's the author of more than 150 publications and is a professor of medicine at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. She received her MD degree from the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Gabo has received numerous awards, including the AMA Nathan Davis Award for Outstanding Public Service, election to the Colorado Women's Hall of Fame, the National Healthcare Leadership Award, Lifetime Achievement Awards from both the Denver Business Journal and the Bonfee Stanton Foundation, Innovators in Health Award from the New England Healthcare Institute, and the David E. Rogers Award from the Association of the American Medical Colleges. Um, she's active in a number of healthcare organizations, the Nas National Association of Public Hospitals, the Commonwealth Commission for Higher Performing Health System, and is a commissioner to the Medicaid and CHIP Payment Access Commission. Welcome, Dr. Gabo. <laughs> Dr. Donna Lynn, which I'm not used to calling her Dr. <laughs> Donna Lynn, so Donna, Donna. Um, <laughs> is the group president for the Kaiser Foundation Health Plan and Kaiser Foundation Hospitals. She's responsible now for Colorado, the Pacific Northwest, Ohio, Georgia regions. Uh, the, the Kaiser Permanente Colorado has about 525 members, and the balance of those outside of Colorado have an additional 870,000 members, with a total revenue of about $6 billion. Uh, Kaiser Permanente owns and operates 20 full-service medical offices in Denver, Boulder, Southern Colorado, and is the state's largest medical practice organization. Prior to joining Kaiser and moving to Colorado, Dr. Lynn had several other associated positions. She was CEO of the group Health Incorporated, a $2.5 billion managed care organization. She was executive director of the New York Business Group on Health, uh, and she's had various uh, positions in the New York City government. She has a bachelor's degree in economics and political science from the University of New Hampshire, a master's degree in public administration from George Washington, and a doctorate in public health from Columbia. She also has received numerous awards, the President's Award on Women in Health Management, the Healthcare Leadership Award from the New York Business Group on Health, Denver Business Journal's 2008 Ast Outstanding Women in Business Award, and the 2009 Distinguished Coloradoan Award from the University of Colorado School of Pharmacy. 
She serves on numerous boards, including the eHealth Initiative, the Colorado Legacy Foundation, the Colorado Regional Health Information Organization, the Denver Metro Chamber of Commerce, the Denver Public Schools Foundation, and the U.S. Bank of Denver. I don't know what she does in her spare time, but welcome to Donna Lynn. So to get started, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start. I have a, a number of questions for the panelists here. And uh, we're going to have them alternate starting. So I'd like to start off and, and first ask you to make any opening comments that you might, might have, and then get right into a very meaty question. And that question is, is can and should the current American health care system be maintained? Patty, you want to start with that? Yes, and I'll get right into the meat. <laughs> um, I think from, if you look at it from a whole variety of perspectives, um, I don't think the current American healthcare system either can or should be maintained. First of all, it's not a system, which is a core problem. And um, we have five really significant issues with our current healthcare. Some of them uh, you already alluded to, but first we have a big problem with coverage and access. We're the only developed country in the world that doesn't choose to provide coverage to all our citizens. So we have 50 million people outside the tent of healthcare. And I think on Friday night, they're all in our ER. <laughs> um, and even though we have this problem with coverage, there is a gap between coverage and access. There are cities, actually, in Colorado, where even if you have Medicaid, there's not a single specialist who will see you. So we have this big problem with coverage and access. Then we have a problem with cost. We're spending twice as much as every other developed country, whether you look at percent of GDP or uh, per capita cost. And you alluded to our relationship to the GDP. And another fact that's sort of astounding is if you go back as far as 1981, there were only five years where the growth of the GDP exceeded the growth of health care. And you know, you don't have to be an economist to figure out where that leads you. And you know, I think all of us would say, well, if you're spending twice as much as every other developed country, the quality must be better than every other developed country. But um, every two years, the Commonwealth Fund does a comparison on 37 variables that measure health care. And we get a grade of 65 out of 100, which I don't know how you grade, but <laughs> I think that's a C. Isn't it? Yeah. Um, so, um, and these are things that other countries have achieved. They're not some theoretical goal. Then we have huge variation uh, by geography, social class, and ethnicity. If, you, if you're poor and you live in Texas, Mississippi, Alabama, you're in a lot worse shape than if you're poor and you live in Minnesota, Iowa, or Massachusetts. And I think we should ask ourselves a core question that in America, is it OK to have where you live determine if you live. Um, I think that's a pretty serious question. And, and then finally, we have complexity that is just beyond belief in our system. And the amount of money we spend on the administrative complexity that doesn't buy a single person one jot of health is uh, really sobering. So I think when you look at all that array, you say, why wouldn't we want to fix this? Thanks, Patty. Donna. Thanks, Scott. Well, I think we're going to disappoint you because Patty and I are probably going to agree on almost <laughs> everything. So the first is, is, my first thought was, I thought you were asking a trick question. <laughs> Should the American healthcare system be maintained? precisely because it isn't a system. Yeah. And so I completely agree with Patty's point. I mean, the fact, I, I think of it as it's an economist's nightmare when you think about 
all of the classical tenets of economics. So go back to Economics 101, right? Buyers and, uh, and, and purchasers and suppliers should have information, clear information that clearly doesn't exist in our current system. So it's an imperfect market in many ways. Um, I'm not a big believer that it should be as um, free market based as it is, and that might surprise people given where I come from, but um, it is, as Patty said, a really complex system. And there are so many fingers in this pie that is, as of 2011, approaching $3 trillion that um, the complexity sometimes undermines what we're trying to do. Because at the end of the day, what we really want to ask, this is a business school, is are we getting value for the money that we're spending? And um, in fact, we are spending not just more than any other country, but getting worse outcomes. So that's really a problem. We're not getting value. And we have to ask ourselves a question, why aren't we getting value? So a couple of facts I'd add to your facts. Uh, the United States spends, um, there are only two countries in the world that spend as much in their total GDP as we spend just on health care. So Japan and China are the only two countries that do that. So when Scott gave some of the data about uh, health care being about 17 to 18 percent of GDP, I really think we're looking ahead at learning to accept that we are going to be in excess of 20 percent of the gross domestic product in a very short period of time. So the confluence of what we're dealing with as a society in terms of our deficit, uh, the facts that Scott gave you in terms of the aging of the population, people moving into Medicare, means that we are, gonna, we are literally headed for a crisis. I, I firmly believe that it will not be too far from now, and we're going to talk a little bit about health care reform and what it means, that we are going to either have too much debt or we're going to say we just can't afford to do the other things that we need to do as a society. So I think um, the current system can't be maintained. I think the bill, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes, has done a lot because the fact that we will, by 2014, not have 50 million people who are uninsured. We will only have 15 million people that are uninsured. But it certainly is a big leap from where we are today. And making sure that people have the right kind of care and the right kind of preventive services is really going to be important to um, managing our costs. But as I said, my view is there are way too many um, self-interested organizations, and that could include health plans, it could include hospitals, doctors, pharmaceutical companies. We just have made, um, I think, a pretty, uh, it is the Wild West in American healthcare, and I think we need to think about how we, quite frankly, use uh, the dreaded R word, not rationing, but regulating, trying to figure out how we put some of these costs and some of the value in perspective. Stana. Well, I'll uh, let you kind of go with the next one, too. Both of you spend a lot of time in Washington, D.C., and at our state capitol. Uh, and you both clo obviously closely follow the progress of the, what's called the Affordable Health Care for America Act, also called health care reform. Um, can you give us an update on the status and let us know what you're watching most carefully as this progresses? Sure. So um, I think first and foremost, in spite of what I think everybody saw the House do last week, there's pretty much universal agreement that this is the law. It's going to stay the law. Um, there will be some tweaking. There may be some changes in the law. Um, the big if in this whole bill is that the Secretary of Health and Human Services has to take a 2,700-page bill that has a lot of empty spaces in it and turn it into regulation. And so that is going to create um, a lot of dynamics. It's um, quite frankly what keeps me up at night not knowing what's ahead of us. What we've had to do so far, um, particularly from the health plan side, is we've had a pretty hectic first six months of the law. So the law was signed on uh, March 23rd, and huge changes happened. You may not all feel that, but um, if your businesses you may have felt it. If you're a parent of a child who's 26 or younger, you may have felt it because you can now cover those children. If you need preventive care, you may feel it because you're no longer paying for 80 different preventive services. If you have a child who wants insurance, uh, we are required now to give those insurance to children irrespective of any medical conditions. So there's lots of things that happened in the first six months of the bill, but it's literally the tip of the iceberg. And so what um, 
we're looking at is what is the Secretary of Health and Human Services still to do? And the big frontier, quite frankly, is going to be right here in Colorado and in each state house because over the next uh, literally couple of months here in Colorado, uh, the biggest thing to happen in healthcare in I don't know how many years is going to happen, and that is that our um, legislature in Colorado and the governor should be passing and signing into law something called a health insurance exchange. So when you think about health care reform and the 32 to 35 million people that are going to get health insurance in 2014 under this bill, 16, mil billion, um, excuse me, 16 million of them are going to end up in these things that don't exist right now called exchanges. And this, each state has to create an exchange. It is, in essence, a supermarket or a co-op, however you want to look at it, where individual consumers, not employers for the most part, there will be some small employers, but a lot of individuals will be getting their health care coverage. So that legislation is about to be introduced in the State House. We're doing some work now, and um, that's a huge issue. At the same time, uh, 17 states, actually it's 20 states now, including Colorado, are just challenging the constitutionality of the law under the Interstate Commerce Clause. So we have a lot of uncertainty about whether or not the law will be upheld. Um, there have been some lower court rulings that have upheld it and some that have said it's not constitutional to require people to buy health insurance. So that will be played out. And from my perspective, what's interesting is we are acting as if this law is going to exist. So we're doing everything we can to plan for it spending literally millions of dollars on building the infrastructure to support it, uh, working to expand in Medicaid and do all the other things that we have to do, but we could potentially see a court decision that overturns it or, depending on the 2012 elections, a political dynamic that would also overturn it. So there's lots that's going on. I think one thing that's interesting that I um, have noted is that a lot of the drama, other than what's going on in Congress, which is very political, which probably doesn't have a lot to do with the merits of what we ought to do with the health care system, is, is that the polls indicate that we, average people, are not getting as agitated as we might have been six months, nine months ago about health care reform. It's becoming to become accepted by the people who are going to get coverage, who perhaps are going to have to give up a little bit as others get coverage. So I think. The political dynamic will be really important to watch over uh, the next couple of months. But for me, the big action is going to be in the state and how we begin to work with um, the governor and with his appointees and trying to put these exchanges and get them up and running so we can cover everybody by 2014. Thank you. Patty, you want to come? Sure. Um, <clears throat> well, I'd like to go back a little bit to the uh, legislation being passed and uh, why it's so difficult to get health reform. And I think both Scott and Don alluded to it. I mean, when you have a $2.5 trillion industry, that's 17% of your GDP, there are a lot of people making a lot of money off of the current dysfunctional system. <laughs> and one thing I learned early on in my career is when you try to take money out of somebody's hand, it doesn't usually work. <laughs> um, and so uh, this is a core problem. We've let it get so big, and there's so much money in play that trying to change it, uh, everybody lines up. Uh, you know, not in my backyard, not in my wallet, basically. Um, the other thing I would say about the legislation is even those of us who support it know it's imperfect. I mean, it didn't take us one year to get this screwed up, and one bill isn't going to get it fixed. Um, even if you look at Medicaid and Medicare, it's really evolved tremendously from when it was first enacted. So this legislation will have to have fixes. There is no question. Um, so I think, to me, the three big issues about given where we are now is um, will it be pulled apart? I think it's not going to be repealed, but it could be pulled apart. And it is so complex that if you start taking pieces out, 
it's like dominoes. The whole thing could unravel and not make any sense. And um, I think Donna could talk from a health plan. If you take out the individual mandate, but you keep in covering everybody who has a pre-existing condition, you know, the dollars just don't work. Um, the um, other issue that worries me is that much of this uh, expansion of coverage is going to be in Medicaid. 16 million of the people who are going to be covered will be in Medicaid. And that Medicaid, unlike Medicare, is a state and federal shared uh, expense. So in most states, it's roughly 50% of the cost comes out of state taxpayer dollars. And if you look around the country, uh, the states are not in all that great financial situation. Um, Colorado is facing a billion dollar shortfall, and uh, they don't have a lot of places to get the money from. I mean, it's education, prisons, and health care. Um, uh, so, that's a problem. And if you look at what's going on at some of the states, Arizona just submitted a waiver to take 285,000 people off their Medicaid rolls. So if you start to dismantle Medicaid, either by cutting provider uh, fees or taking people off rolls, and yet you're relying on Medicaid to be foundational, for uh, coverage expansion, it, it becomes yeah. pretty hard to put those two pieces of the puzzle together. And the last thing is, Donna alluded to the size of this bill, and one of the things I hate is regulation. And um, um, I always say, we want evidence-based medicine. Every time I go to Washington, I say, how about evidence-based regulation? <laughs> Um, um, and they laugh just like you do. Um, but um, you, it's hard to imagine a bill of this complexity that isn't going to create more layers of, of regulation. And, and what we need is simplification, uh, which is going to be very hard to do. But having said that, I'm a fan, because my old Italian grandfather always said to me, my girl, Rome wasn't built in a day. <laughs> and so I, we have to start down this path of changing the system somewhere, even though our first steps may not be perfect. You know, Scott, one of the things that I know, I know how Patty and I think, um, and one thing we haven't talked about is the nature of the current healthcare system being based on a fee-for-service model. And fundamentally, when the bill was being debated, back to the how we get to where we are, um, my view, and it's not just because of where I sit professionally, is there was a villain, and then there were other organizations that were untouchable. And the villain was health plans, or health and the health insurance industry. And um, what people didn't talk about was that there are lots of villains. You know, we're, we're all culpable. Consumers are culpable. MedMal insurers are culpable, drug companies, how, you name it, we all have a piece in creating this system. But underneath it all is the fact that we allow a fee-for-service system. So we allow, back to the economics thing, we allow, in many cases, uh, supply to drive demand. We don't have it the other way around. We allow people to set prices. We allow, unfortunately, doctors to set prices, hospitals to set prices, drug manufacturers to set prices, and to create demand. So you as a consumer are subject to the system where, and we perceive sometimes, more is better. More is not necessarily better. You know, you've seen some articles about uh, the damage from excessive radiation. Uh, maybe you don't need that MRI. Maybe that's not the most effective and efficient way to deliver care. So this fee-for-service system that we have, I think there's general agreement. It's pretty broken. But because there are so many oxes that were going to be gored uh, in this bill, if they touch the fee-for-service system, Congress and the President made a decision not to do that, not to take on those issues. 
So what is not in the bill is, is, is really problematic. And the reform of what we call fee-for-service medicine or a delivery system reform is not happening in the 2,700 pages. There are some pilot programs and bundled payments and some episode treatment groups and all kinds of other healthcare lingo that we could talk about, but the bottom line is the system's still gonna exist and that's still gonna create some bad incentives and keep the cost of healthcare going up. Uh, can I weigh in on that too? We agree on this. We have gotta get rid of fee-for-service. I mean, human beings behave in the way they're rewarded. And if you pay for widgets, you're going to get a lot of widgets. <laughs> it's as simple as that. Yeah, very good. Thank you. So what do you think will be the most significant impacts of this act on businesses and employers? What should business leaders be thinking about in, about in the issues around health care? Do you see this act as a positive or a negative? Or you know, what, what should business leaders be thinking about associated with this bill? Patty, you want to start? Well, I'm not an economist. I'm a nephrologist by <laughs> training. Uh, so if you have a problem with your kidneys, I might do better. But, but uh, on the other hand, I do run a system where 46% um, of the people who use it can't pay us. And that's not your dream business model. <laughs> um, so um, maybe I do understand a little bit about making money. Um, but uh, I guess um, I would just say, I, th I think that the whole issue of how businesses are paying for this is, is an interesting question. T in 2003, we did a study at Denver Health, um, and 57% uh, of all our uninsured users were employed. They were employed by 12,000 uh, businesses in the metro area. And in that year, our uninsured care for those people represented a $180 million subsidy from Denver Health to the business community, for which we got $27 million back in uh, tax support from the city. So somehow those numbers are very interesting. And, um, but businesses are paying some way. I mean, they're paying. Uh, in, in taxes or they're paying and cost shifting for their insured. I think, uh, to me, overall, over maybe not the first year or two, but over the long haul, this should make American businesses more competitive if we can bring the cost down. Um, and you know, we're in a global world now, and I was on a panel a couple months ago with a CEO of a large international corporation. And he said that where they put their new plants is not based on wages, that by and large wages had pretty much come into equilibrium around the world, but it was about a benefits cost, particularly health care, and they were not going to put any new plants in the United States. Um, that's a pretty sobering thing. And um, the other thing is when you look that Starbucks pays more for health care than for their coffee, that the automobile industry was paying more for health insurance than for steel, and you can go down a whole list of this, we are going to find ourselves, as we really are already, in a very non-competitive situation with jobs moving out of this country to the extent that they are mobile. I mean, there are some jobs, I mean, RED is not going to move to India. But, um, but there are lots of things that can move. And uh, if we don't get these costs in line, our businesses are not going to be competitive uh, over, the long, over the long haul. So I actually don't see it as a job killing bill. I see it as a playing field leveling bill with us and the rest of the world. So um, just remember, Patty's the doctor. If you have a heart attack, go to her, not me. <laughs> and she's the economist. I'm the economist. So let her answer the <laughs> So I can tell the patient's dying. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, when you do these things, you have somebody who works for you, and they do talking points. So I'm going to completely ignore the person who wrote the, the, the note on this, because the person said, 
there's a net positive impact for employers, and I totally don't believe it. <laughs> so um, let's talk a little bit about what businesses spend. Businesses spend, if you're a large employer, or even a mid-sized employer, you're spending about $15,000 a year for an employee that works for you for their health care, assuming they have a family. And you probably have some contribution formula, but believe it or not, there still are some people that don't, or they pay 90%. So $15,000 a year, to Patty's point, on top of the wages and unemployment and pension and everything else that you spend. In that $15,000 a year, almost $2,000 of it is what we call a cost shift. It's money that employers are paying today because the federal government and the state government aren't paying enough for people who are in Medicare or Medicaid or because there's uninsured people. So in theory, what should happen, you would think, is more people get covered, you don't have to pay this cost shift anymore. Well, that's not true, because here's what's going to happen with health care reform. We're going to cover more people, and we're going to get less money. Okay? We are not, there's not some new, there's some revenue coming. Guess what? We're all going to be taxed more to pay for health care reform. That's part of the bill. People who are on Medicare are going to be taxed more, and people who are on Medicare are going to get less benefits. Guess who's on Medicare in this room in the next 10 years? Probably a good percentage of people. <laughs> so the bill is going to cut back some benefits. It's really not going to increase reimbursement. I mean, Patty and I, as we participate in some of these programs, have to run a business and get less revenue and cover more people. So it's a financial, uh, it's, a, it's a really a financial disaster from my perspective in terms of what we're being asked to do. Um, is, there, is, there, is there a silver lining somewhere? Yeah, the silver lining is that we're going to start covering more people. But that's beginning, beginning in 2014. That's not in the next couple of years. So when Scott talks about how much health care is increasing, it's double digit clearly for the next few years. <clears throat> Excuse me. Plus. Everything that I talked about when I opened up was how much more we're giving as benefits. So we're covering people up to age 26. We're eliminating co-pays on preventive services. We're taking off annual and, max, annual and lifetime maximums. Good things from your health perspective, not great things from a financial perspective. The, the premise is, as you cover more people, and more people take care of themselves, big premise, right, because we know we're getting more diabetes and more heart disease and everything else. But as more people hopefully don't go to the emergency room, but say I have a primary care doctor, they're going to get healthier. I would argue that that's going to take a really long time for us to see the savings that come from that. Is covering everybody the right thing to do? Absolutely. We should cover the other 15 million people that don't have health care in the United States after this bill comes into effect in 2014 for the uninsured piece. But we're not going to save money. And I think businesses are seeing, they're seeing in 2011. Right now, I know the businesses that I deal with. I'm having to tell them why their costs are going up. The state of Colorado and our legislators and the governor add a little bit to that. Last year, we had some mandates. We get mandates every year. And so that adds two or three more percent to the cost of the premium that businesses pay every year. So the bottom line is it's going to be a tough scenario. There will be some tax breaks for small employers. There will be some tax subsidies for individuals. But I think for businesses overall, um, certainly in the short term, this is not going to be there. You're not going to see some dramatic reduction in your health care costs. They're going to be in the 9 10 percent increase every single year. And uh, as Scott pointed out, with more and more people moving into Medicare and wanting to live longer and having new hips and new <laughs> elbows and new everything else, I think our costs are just going to continue to go up. Whew. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have an upbeat question here. <clears throat> yeah. Could I, could I yeah, just please. say one thing, though? I think we have the rest of the world to look at to say the rest of the world where they cover everyone in a rational way, and maybe we're irrational, they're spending half as much as we are. So somewhere in there, there may be a silver lining. So let's look out 10, and may, may, from what you were saying earlier, it may need to be 20 years. But if you looked in your crystal ball 10 to 20 years from now, how do you see the healthcare system looking from a 
from a service delivery perspective and from a financial perspective? How do you see, what, what does the end game look like or potentially look like from your perspective? Do you want, and you want me to be optimistic, right? Well, no. <laughs> but you can go way out there now because nobody's ever going to call you on it, right? It's 2021. <laughs> I hope to be on the beach. Um, so I think we are going to see health care costs um, at or above where we are now in terms of the percentage of GDP. I don't think they're going to be any lower. We have, again, we have a lot of demand. Just so you understand the dynamics of what we spend in health care, 1% of the population spends 30% of the dollars, okay, 1%. Now, that's also an opportunity because if we can manage some of that, that would be great. But the reality is, is that 80% of what we spend is in the last six months of your life. So I hate to be an economist, but you might argue there is no productive value to what we spend in that last six months of the life. So when Patty talks about what other countries do, they do use that other R word, and they do figure out, you know, what is the best medical technology, or what is the best drug, or should we do a, you know, transplant for somebody who's age 92? Does that make sense? So there are some of those ethical and rationing kind of decisions I don't think we'll ever get to in this country, but that is part of the way, not the entire way, that some of the other European countries in particular deal with some of their health care issues. I do think there are some good things happening. I will be optimistic. So I do think the general awareness and of um, consumers' responsibility for their own health care is just going to increase. First of all, there are more and more technology tools, whether it's mobile apps, they're helping people understand about their health care, how to take care of themselves. So I do think there is more awareness, and we are going to see, in spite of some of the increases in obesity and diabetes, I think we're going to see some improvements in those areas. I do think we will see a situation where there are going to be um, more rewards, um, and that's um, something I know sometimes physicians debate, but more rewards for, for better performance. Right now, we don't, we don't um, pay people based on performance for the most part, pay either hospitals or doctors or even health plans. I mean, a business makes an economic decision, but it isn't always based on performance. And so I think the performance-based payment that we're starting to talk about in healthcare, I think, will um, expand as we go forward. I think the other great thing that's happening, and it's happening so rapidly we can't keep up with it, is health information technology. And so um, Kaiser, uh, I think as many of you know, has an electronic medical record system, um, which we introduced about five years ago for nine uh, million people, it cost us four billion dollars. And it is worth every penny. It's worth every penny because it's given our physicians the tools that they need to make decisions. It's given consumers, probably more important, their own individual electronic medical records. So they can, they can participate in their care. I think the big challenge going forward is, well, Kaiser's done it, Denver Health has done it, a lot of other integrated systems have done it. We now have to do what banking and the airlines industry did. We have to weave it all together so that record is portable, it's yours, and then really confront where a lot of uh, consumer uh, actions are now in, in terms of mobile technology and other um, sort of proactive uses of technology, not just more the administrative side of things. I think technology holds tremendous promise for us in the next 10 years, and I'm hoping that we can figure out how to cobble something together that gets consumers a lot more involved in their health care. And to me, that's what's going to be the key to making this successful. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Penn? Yeah. Well, um, you can't have been, I've been at Denver Health for almost 40 years. And uh, you can't be there um, and not be an optimist. Otherwise, <laughs> you're in the psych unit. Um, <laughs> So, um, so I'm an optimist, and uh, I would like to think that uh, maybe not 10 years, but 15 years down the line, that we will cover everyone in this country with health care coverage, just like every other developed country does, that we'll be spending less money. I, I really think that we don't have any choice. We have to spend less money if we want to leave anything for our children. Um, I would hope that we have evidence-based care, and there are things in this bill to help us understand what is 
evidence-based. We do so many things now. 50% of what we do are either useless or harmful, and we should not do that. Um, that uh, we have high quality care, um, that we have integrated systems of care. I really believe that we have to, healthcare is still a cottage industry by and large in America, and we aren't going to get to either low cost or high quality in that, in that uh, delivery model. I agree that we need uh, sophisticated HIT and we need to move the giving of health care outside of the bricks and mortars of doctor's offices and hospitals uh, into sort of a more between visit kind of a care of the patient by the, for themselves with guidance. Um, and I would love to see the day when we are like Sweden where we have 10 variables to report in regulation um, instead of 10 million. <laughs> And um, I, re I really hope that in the next decade, as a society, we can have some serious debates about end-of-life care. Um, none of us are going to live forever. And uh, I think what, what you mentioned about the end-of-life care, we, we have to discuss this. And um, I think we have to have a serious debate about what is the floor that everyone gets, and what's the ceiling above which you can't get something unless you're willing to pay for it yourself. And I think we have to have another debate, which we haven't yet talked about, and that is, um, should healthcare be a for-profit business? Um, I really have trouble figuring out how, as a for-profit entity, where you have a primary fiduciary responsibility to make stockholders wealthy, or how you can bend the cost curve in that model. And um, maybe that's because I'm not an economist. Um, <laughs> but I think there are a whole series of things that we have to discuss uh, as a society and be willing to not uh, be angry at someone who has a different stance, but really have a civil, enlightened dialogue, which is what democracy should be, about uh, some of these core issues so that we can move forward um, with settling some of these things. And that's my dream. In reality, the whole system may have to implode to be rebuilt, because <laughs> there's too much money in play. So I'm, I'm going to jump on that for-profit pony for a minute. Um, first of all, and I'm a non, we are, Kaiser Permanente is a non-profit organization, so it would be really easy for me to get on the same, and I don't mean soapbox in a negative way, but get in the same place because I could say, you know, not-for-profits are good and for-profits are bad. The reality is, um, and I think there was an article in the Atlantic Monthly about six, six, nine months ago that said that if you took all the profits out of the for-profit health plans in this country, every single one, it would pay for three days of health insurance coverage for people who are uninsured. So that's, to me, it's not the core issue. It is, it is an issue we can talk about because I think politically people can get excited about it. You can debate it. You know, should healthcare be in the public sector? Forget not-for-profit versus for-profit. You know, should it, be a, should it be a free good that we get, like we get education, or should we be taxed for it? So I, I just want to point out that that's not so much the issue. I, I really fundamentally believe the issue is that we're consuming something. We're not informed about it. We're emotional about it. Rightfully so, we're emotional about it. Um, because as I said to Patty before, um, when we were talking was, you know, not my mother, not my father, not me, not my husband, not my daughter, et cetera. So when we come to those end of life decisions, that's where the money is spent. And that's a really difficult issue for us to get our heads around. Can I tell of a course. funny story? Of course. <laughs> about we need that. About <laughs> end of life care. So a number of years ago, we redid our will because our kids were now 18 and, you know, they didn't need a guardian. And, while we were with the lawyer, he says to my husband, we should do your you know, medical power of attorney and all of that. And 
he looked to my husband and he said, I assume you want your wife to have your medical power of attorney. And there was dead silence. <laughs> <laughs> and he looked up very puzzled. And my husband said, well, my wife has very strong feelings about end of life. <laughs> They're very, very funny. By the way, we are, um, <clears throat> we may have, a, we are probably going to have a chance to do a couple of questions. So if you do have questions, I can, we're not going to get to all of them, but please pass them to the aisle and we'll collect those and we'll, uh, we'll see how many we can get to. So my next question really transitions a little bit to your own organization. And part of what we'd like to do in this Voices of Experience is not only talk about the, the, the overall economic issues, but, but actual leadership inside of your own organizations. So looking at your, your, both of your organizations, what do you see changing inside of your organizations? And what, what keeps you awake at night? We may have already talked about this a little bit, but in, in evolving your organizations to, to the uh, evolving healthcare situation. Do you want to start? Yeah. Well, uh, I think that, uh, our organizations actually are very much alike, except she has money. <laughs> um, <laughs> I uh, give you some money every year. <laughs> but uh, but I, I think we're both well prepared for health reform and that we're both integrated systems. We employ our physicians. We both rely heavily on primary care. We've put a lot of money into information technology and and believe in its uh, use, um, but uh, and and we've done a number of other things to prepare. One of the things that we think uh, we're very proud of is we instituted Toyota production systems or Lean at Denver Health, uh, being one of the first healthcare institutions that uh, have done this. And you may laugh about Toyota for a number of reasons, but. Uh, they are very big about getting rid of waste from the customer perspective. And we have 200 black belts in lean at Denver Health. And as of today, since August of 06, we've realized $81 million of financial benefits uh, without laying off one person, without cutting one dime of care to the uninsured. In fact, we've gone up $130 million uh, in that period of time. So, uh, I think we've done a lot of things to uh, make our, our quality very high, our costs very low, and be very efficient. But what keeps me up at night is this year we're going to hit close to $400 million of care to people without insurance. And our bottom line was 0.4%, um, which is sort of like a rounding error. And, uh, and, you know, I don't, I think we'll be very well suited for health reform if we're still here by 2014. And actually, I, I think that uh, that's what keeps me up at night, is will we be able to piece together uh, funding for this growing problem uh, to get to, uh, to that, uh, that place? 2014, yeah. But you, Donna. So in terms of how I think we're going to evolve as an organization, and maybe not just as an organization, but as people, is I think we all are going to have to be a lot more consumer focused. I mean, we, we are businesses, but the nature of how health care is going to be acquired is going to change a lot. So the traditional model is you're, you work for an employer, your employer makes the decision for you. You might have only one choice, maybe you'll have two choices, but that's going to evolve pretty substantially. And so I think we have to be more uh, customer focused than we have been. Uh, we also have to be less sick care focused. I mean, we all, whether we're a hospital or a health plan or an ambulatory setting, we take care of people who come to us when they're sick. There's this other group of people that don't come to us at all. And there are some people, not me, who go, wow, thank God they didn't come in this year, um, because you make money on that. And my view is, is that we can't um, afford to do that, because we don't know what they're doing. It doesn't imply that they're perfectly healthy. They could be doing the wrong thing by not having a relationship with a physician, not by not using technology that's available to help them to think about how they can really get to the best in terms of their health care. So, 
Uh, a lot of people in healthcare talk about we don't want to be about providing sick care, we want to be providing health care. Um, I do think that we have um, some challenges to think beyond our traditional borders, whether it's Denver and Denver Health or Kaiser and our service area, because uh, more and more people are mobile and healthcare doesn't just have to be the traditional, let me get in my car, drive someplace, sit in a waiting room, sit in another waiting room, go back and make a payment. And so I think we've got to evolve the model a little bit, again, back on the lines of consumers being more participatory and technology fostering that. My view is I never want to see a doctor. I never want to see a doctor. I want to be able to email my doctor, which I can do at Kaiser. I want to be able to make my appointment online if I do have to go in, and I want to be able to read my labs and not have any human being get involved in my care. I may be weird, but that's how I feel. But I do think it, it creates, I've got some self-interest in making sure that I'm healthy and that I get care in the way that's the most effective for me. So I think my organization and others have to really evolve to be even more consumer focused than they have been utilizing technology, focus on prevention uh, and coordinating care. And I think the last thing, and I think Scott, you probably want to get to this if we have time, is the um, what kind of people do we need? And I think we need different people in our organizations. You know, not just um, I know Patty's done work with Lean, we've done work with Lean, and I think it's great to you know, ring out some of the process improvement. But I'm looking at bringing in people from other industries, not healthcare, to help us think about how we do healthcare better. Um, because I think if you just sort of stay in your same box, you're going to keep thinking about it in the conventional way that you've always done it. And so I think um, many of the consumer-facing uh, organizations, I'm one of the biggest Zappos fans, if anybody else is a Zappos fan. Um, so I think the way they do customer service and the way they think about what they provide is great. There's lots of other organizations that you could talk about that do that, and I think that's a place that we're going to go in the future. That's great. Well, you know, it's interesting because <clears throat> uh, Patty alluded to the fact that, that healthcare is so highly regulated, and, and I, I think what's happened in the healthcare industry is, is build very compliance based organizations, that the organizations are built around making sure, absolutely sure, that we comply with all the regulations, which almost goes against change. Uh, what, do you, what do you see as leaders? How, how are you going to make those transformational changes? inside of your organizations that are going to look totally different 10 years from now? What are, what are the things that you're going to do as leaders? You already talked about needing different kinds of people. Any other things that you're, you're thinking about? I always try to encourage people to take risks because I think that's the only way that you learn. And so whether you, um, g giving people permission to make mistakes I think is really important because we really need to innovate and change the way that we're delivering a lot of services now. So in addition to what I said, which is hiring people from outside of healthcare to come in and help us look at the way we do things, um, obviously ringing out whatever uh, inefficiencies we can find in the system, but I want people who are willing to raise their hand and jump off a cliff, because yeah. um, that's what I like to do. <laughs> Any, any? And we'll take you to our trauma center because you're insured. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's one other thing that I, I guess, uh, par partnering is important. I mean, and you can see with Patty and I, I mean, we, we, our organizations do some work together. We're going to have to do more work together, and that isn't. Um, you know, we do this much work together. I think in the future we're going to have to do that much work together. So there are a lot of different organizations in healthcare who seek to survive in their own silo. And we're not going to be allowed to do that anymore. And because of the nature of Medicaid and CHIP and the exchanges are going to create a lot of interdependencies and partnerships that didn't exist mm -hmm. before, and I think that's really a good thing. So sorry. No. Um, well, on a number of years, you know I'm an old woman. And, uh, <laughs> So a number of years ago, I said, I can't stand this anymore. We're doing things just like we did when I was an intern 40 years ago. Uh, you know, we have new drugs and new technology. But basically, you know, it's the same. And um, we said, we really need to step back and ask, how do you really perfect the patient experience and, and really get it right? And I agree, you have to look outside. and. We, we did a number of things. We put together an advisory group that had the head of global health for Microsoft, the head of labor for the Ritz-Carlton, 
the Associate Director of the FedEx Center for Supply Chain Management, a physician astronaut. Um, and uh, we brainstormed with them. And we hired an industrial engineer who had never been in healthcare to come in and look at all our processes, which I will tell you is not for the squeamish. <laughs> and, um, and at the end of this, we said, you know, there, if you're really going to get this right, there are sort of six rights that need to be linked together in a puzzle. Um, you need the right physical environment, and I'm not talking about waterfalls. You know, you, you need spaces that are built differently. Uh, that are built to support families and workforce and are efficient. Um, you need the right communication, because doctors and nurses don't communicate at all the same way. So it, it needs to be a structured communication. Uh, that we, we learned that from our astronaut. And from the Ritz, we learned that you have to select people for personal qualities, not their resume. And we actually use the same firm as the Ritz-Carlton uses to select our employees. And you need the right reward system, which we stole from FedEx. And you need the right customer service. And, and you need the right process. And that's where we adopted Toyota Production or Lean. And you know, if you talk to the people who are experts in Lean, they'll tell you that 60 to 90% of every process is waste. And uh, we are now believers that that is true. And so there's a lot of waste in our, in our whole delivery model that could be fixed. But I think if we, if we really concentrate as leaders of putting those six things together in a meaningful way, um, that we can really be transformative uh, within our delivery systems. Great. Thank you. We've got uh, some really good questions up here. And I'm trying to figure out which hand grenade to throw first. Um, <clears throat> so here, here's a nice political one. How do you see the large immigration issues in the US impacting the cost of health care? Well, I, I mean, it does impact the cost of health care because you're, if you're living here and you get sick, you're going to go somewhere to get cared for. So I don't think that's complex. But what I do think is com should be commented on is I don't think that it's the health care system that should fix the immigration issue. I don't think that we should, as a physician, decide whether we're going to treat someone or not based on their immigration status. The federal government needs to fix its immigration policy. And, uh, and that's where it lies. And it doesn't lie at the border of RED. It lies at the borders of, of the country. Any comment? Um, boy, this is a political one. <laughs> I, I don't think uh, Kaiser has a position on it, but I'll, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. I mean, do, you can think about it as if anyone who's in this country, whether they're legally, illegally here, or a visitor, we have a public health responsibility for, because what they bring into the country or what they're not treated for could potentially be a public health problem. So I think we can't deny that. The, what I think the, um, the press has certainly gotten a field day around you know, a couple of stories of uh, somebody who came across the border, likely illegally, ends up in a hospital, and, and somebody is paying for lots and lots of care for them. Um, again, I would, I would say, although I don't have the numbers at my fingertips, that's not the problem. I mean, it is part of a problem with 57 pieces to it. But that, if we you know, refused care to anybody who didn't have you know, a US citizenship, that's not going to solve our health care problem. So here's, here's kind of a totally different one. What do you think of concierge medicine and company doctors in-house in the future? Do you want to start with that? So just a level set concierge medicine, if you don't know about it, is basically um, while you might have a health plan uh, or may not have a health plan, for a fee, usually I've seen them about $5,000. You pay uh, a doctor or a group $5,000, and it means they're on call 24-7. They'll come to your house. They'll be there for you whenever you need them. It gets a little into the haves and the have-nots. 
So I'm not a big fan of it. Um, and obviously, it creates a two-tiered structure of healthcare. And back to the old thing, it just doesn't get at the problem. That is not a solution to what we're facing in healthcare today, is that you create a cadre of people who can take care of you 24-7. Quite frankly, people with that kind of money should know better and should be taking care of themselves. <laughs> <laughs> Any comment on that, Patty? Well, for the population we serve, this is not an issue. <laughs> 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 thank you, thank you for that. <clears throat> okay, this is an interesting one. Much, much of what you have spoken about involves government and regulatory solutions to healthcare improvement. Where does the individual's choices for behavior fit? I.e., smoking, fast food, high risk. Why should we pay for their care if they don't take it seriously? Well, I think this is um, an important question that along with the other issues that I said we should debate as a society, we have to have a discussion about this. On the other hand, I, I would say that um, we, we can carry personal responsibility too far. I mean, I've been trying to lose 15 pounds for 15 years. <laughs> um, and, and I think I'm a pretty disciplined person. It, human behavior is, is very hard to change. And I would say that the, the other comment I would make about personal responsibility, and I've learned this from taking care of the population that I've taken care of at Denver Health, is if all your life you've had it very difficult, you were born into a family that was very poor, you got a substandard education. You've gotten a low paying job. You, you have none of the support systems that many of us come to rely on. And then you say, well, you need to be res more responsible for your health. Um, we probably all could have the same personal responsibility if we all had the same advantages. Um, but we all don't have the same advantages. So I, I think we, we do have to try to help everybody take care of themselves better. That is an obligation that we as healthcare deliverers should do. And uh, as a society, we should try to do. But I think we can't be too harsh about where that line of personal responsibility lies until we have a completely just and equal society, which I know I will not live long enough to see because I am too old. <laughs> um, so yes, it's a slippery slope, but I guess I'll take the question head on a little differently, which is that um, I, don't, I think there's something to be said for paying people to do the right thing or rewarding them in some way to do the right thing. And um, incentive programs have been shown to have some really great results. So we can incent people to improve their health care, to maintain their health care status if they're already at really good levels. And we can use either um, cash payments. We do this at Kaiser. I, get, I actually get a little bit of money, not a lot, but to go get my screenings every year. We incent people to get what we call health risk appraisals, where they take a baseline of a snapshot of what their health care is, their health status is, and then we look a year later at their improvement. So there is a lot of money that I think um, you can use to incent people. If money isn't the right incentive, there are other ways of rewarding. We do some team-based competitions to you know, maintain your weight during the holidays. There's lots of way to get people energized to take care of their health, and I think we have to do that, and I don't think it's a bad thing to put some incentives on the table. Um, I am surprised at how many people are opposed to things like uh, different premium rates, for example. I mean, we, we lived with that for many years with life insurance, smoker and non-smoker rates, but when you do a focus group of individuals and, you know, should you pay less money for your health care if you're healthier, um, I've seen focus groups where 70% of the people say absolutely not, which is pretty astounding. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. We have time for one more, and it's actually should be reasonably short, <clears throat> and I'll, I'll add on to this, but it says, which country has the most efficient health care system and why? 
And I guess I would add on to that, what, what are your models? What, what are the models out there that you've seen that are intriguing that maybe we could look at um, as, as a model and how we might solve this? I don't know if a fish, well, so maybe I'll modify the question. A fish <laughs> isn't the only measure. I mean, right. so there are systems, as Patty mentioned, most of the OECD countries spend about half of what we spend, and they have better health care outcomes. So they, um, infants live longer, you know, men and women's length of life is longer, et cetera. So um, the one, and it, it depends on the year. Patty knows because she's part of some international groups, and I've been to about eight different countries to study health care. Every year there's a new country that's in vogue, right? So it was Sweden once. France was big, right? And Sicko, everybody watched Sicko. <laughs> um, the Netherlands is sort of the, at the head of the class this year. Um, but when you look at, and it's interesting because the countries do swap places and the Commonwealth Fund does studies if people are interested in looking at that, just go to the Commonwealth Fund's website and they every uh, two years evaluate uh, the United States compared to six OECD countries. And they look at quality of care, service, affordability, access, et cetera. So the one that um, has emerged, interestingly enough, uh, most recently, uh, or has come back, is England. So that's kind of funny because most people many years ago thought England was not a great place to get health care. So the countries move back and forth, but clearly most of the European countries are doing um, substantially better than we are in terms of the percentage of GDP, GDP as well as their health outcomes. Uh, I would agree with that. I think it's hard to pick which European country uh, is doing better this year, but they're all doing better than us, so <laughs> pick one. Um, um, I also think that we're very xenophobic about trying to learn from any other country. So I've been pushing that we have a lot of models in America that are working well. I mean, Kaiser is always brought up as a model. Um, Denver Health is brought up as a model that we're very cost efficient, very high quality, we're integrated. I think we can learn from the models that are working in America and in general, as a country, we are more open to things that we see here in our own country than going to uh, another country. Although I think you could pick any European country and have a system that's better than ours. Um, good. And being a good Italian girl, I, maybe I'll pick it. <laughs> yeah. Good. Well, it's about time to, to wrap this up. So let's give a round of applause for the tremendous. <clears throat> and we do have a uh, wonderful gift to uh, thank, you. thank you for. Hopefully, it's just not a chocolate. small token. It's not chocolate. <laughs> it's not cigarettes. <laughs> it's wine. <laughs> it's wine. Anyway, another round of applause for this tremendous expertise. So just so you know, um, our next one, we, we have our next Voices of Experience coming up on us very quickly. In fact, it's in two weeks. Um, and we have on February 7th, uh, Stephen Chipman, the CEO of Grant Thornton, who's going to be talking about social, uh, so, corporate social responsibility and its connection to their growth strategy. Ought to be a very, very interesting session. So we'll be hopefully see you in a couple weeks. So uh, with that, the food is in the back. And uh, we thank you very much for coming tonight. Hope you found this valuable. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you.